Hi, I'm Sue. Thanks for joining me for the introduction to the Bible book of Nahum. This one's going to be a little bit different because I'm not at home. I'm traveling, so I don't have my normal hardcover resources available. This time I'm using some internet commentaries and scholarly sources. Um, we're just looking at four sections here for this overview. should be pretty quick. It's a background and purpose, and then a little timeline, and then a short outline of the book, and then a summary and some, some final thoughts on it. What an interesting book this is. This book, they think, was written around 640 B.C., um, so some put it in the time range between 667 and 612, and that number 612 is going to come in play in a few minutes when we look at our timeline. But so 640 is right in the middle of that range, so I guess that's why they say about 640. I don't know if they averaged it out or where they get that from. Depending on what source you look at, that time frame is a little different, um, but it's all in that range between 667 and 612. BC. Now, remember, well, for those who don't know, um, when you get to um, these times on the Gregorian calendar before the year zero and one, it counts backwards. I'm sure most people know that, but BC stands for before Christ. So one, even though it's not exactly when Christ was born, um, one is around that time of Christ in the earth. And so the Gregorian calendar splits, splits it, BC being the years before Christ and AD being after. The AD stands for Anno Domini, which is Latin for in the year of the Lord. Um, some people use the uh, acronym BCE, which is short for before the common era. Instead of BC, they use that BCE. Um, the common era, era begins with the year one in the Gregorian calendar. So when you say, um, when you have any time frame before zero, it counts backwards. So in other words, in this instance, we're going from 667 forward in time to 612. So instead of going up in numbers, it goes down all the way until zero. And then we start counting again from zero, like to today, 2021, we count up to that, right? All right, so Nahum was in, uh, it says in the Bible itself that he was an Elkishite from Elkosh, of which the uh, the PDF that's listed in the, in the description says no one knows of. The only thing we know of it is from what's written in the word. And by the way, you can find the uh, notations for all the sources I'm using in the description of the YouTube video. So we have Nathan, the Elkishite. Author Pinker says that Nahum consoled, I'm sorry, Nathan's, Nathan, Nahum's name, I need to slow down. Nahum's name means consoled, comforted, or reassured, and that it only occurs once in the Hebrew Bible. So embedded in this story is the message of the Messiah, of hope, of comfort, the comfort of redemption. So this may seem like a contradiction when we read this gloomy poem because it's about the fall of Assyria and her capital Nineveh, but we're gonna see how this whole concept of, of comfort and consolation comes in as we read through there. It's, it's a wonderful contrast that, that occurs in this little book. Um, through the message of the Messiah and through God's great love and mercy. It's all intertwined in here. So you have this great contrast between this this terrorizing, violent um, oppressor versus God's tender and great love and his wrath in protecting that what he loves. So um, not only is it a, 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 this message of Nahum against Assyria and her capital, but it's also very good news for Israel and many others who were willing to rend their hearts toward God. And it's a broader message to the nations and all the way to us here in our day. Um, author Pinker says, the sole purpose of Nahum's prophecy was to breach the wall of hopelessness and persuade his listeners that there is light at the end of the tunnel. See, they were so oppressed by this, this great nation, this, this fearful nation. Um, it seemed impossible to them. They were just under their thumb. So Pinker says, the sole purpose of Nahum's prophecy was to breach this wall of hopelessness, persuade his listeners that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that salvation is coming, and that a complete downfall of Assyria is in the making. This seemingly invincible oppressor, who had overwhelmed the entire region from the Tigris to the Nile, left very little hope for freedom and independence. He said this monumental task apparently had completely absorbed Nahum, emotionally and intellectually. It required dedication of his energy, poetic capability, and logical and theological reasoning to make his case and convince his audience. So Nahum receives this vision against Assyria, against Nineveh, which was the capital, because of their wickedness, because of what they were doing, hurting people, the climate they were creating, you know, the culture they were allowing, um, the spirits they were allowing in. And so she's going to be invaded and subdued by Babylon, another 
great terrorists, but God's going to use them and use them not only here, but in other instances you see in scripture um, as his tool to uh, to come against these, these terrifying and wicked rulers. So this word against is another theme in this book. It depicts people groups pit against each other. Um, it depicts Assyria with their heel against those under their domination. It depicts God being against what the Bible Project calls the perpetual cycle of violent oppressors. So think about it. this is really how it's been through most of history. As Americans, we're once removed from this kind of thing with our peaceful transition of power. But, you know, throughout history, this is how nations and tribes and nations took each other over. When a country invaded another one, the leaders were killed. People were taken from slaves. And if you don't want to comply, you're killed. I mean, this is 20, um, August 2021. Look at Afghanistan right now. There's no peaceful transition of power there, right? This is what makes America so exceptional and really a miracle in light of this fallen world that we live in. It's really a little little uh, a city on a hill, right? A light. It has been and, and hopefully will remain so. So Pastor Landon calls this book the sequel to Jonah. I thought that was so interesting. Never thought about that before. And I'm going to do, uh, give you a little timeline in a minute that's going to make that really clear. Um, but Jonah prophesied against Nineveh, remember, and they repented. Well, here we are now, <clears throat> excuse me, with Nahum prophesying against Nahum. So what happened? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so Nineveh repented for a while and then went back to doing what violent demons do, right? Everything we just talked about, oppressing the people. In other words, they return to their own vomit, as the scripture says, like dogs, right? I mean, their wickedness didn't stay subdued. It, it just grew back, right? Like leaven, like yeast. A little yeast leavens the whole lump, right? So so they weren't transformed. They weren't changed. They might have repented, but it just it just came back like a cancer, right? Their wickedness seeped back out. So um, another really... Um, how would you say it? Another another proof of the need for a savior. So they they invaded Israel. They repented, and then they invaded Israel. So they incurred God's wrath. Bad idea, right? And so that's how we end up with Nahum here. So here's a little timeline for for you visual people. If you can picture a line, I'm going to give you five points on that timeline, and um, this is going to tie in the major and minor prophets that we've read to date. A little bit about what we've read so far that we see all the way from, you know. Uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations all the way to now and even though all those books aren't necessarily in chronological order um, they all sort of play into this this time range this timeline okay but I'm only going to give you five points on this timeline so you had Jonah who we just read in one of our last few books Jonah was around 760 BC so as you go up the timeline now you have um, remember Nineveh repented but now we're moving up in time and they invaded Israel in the north in 721 BC. Now I'm gonna stop again and say what I say every time. Israel had judges, then they had kings, and then uh, they had three kings, and then the kingdom split into two. So again, get your visual of the, the this country of Israel. You had, um, like we know it today, you know that landmass. You had Israel in the north with um, Samaria as her capital, and then you had Judah in the south with Jerusalem as her capital. So those are the two kingdoms of Israel, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. So we're up here in the north after Nineveh um, repented, after Jonah prophesied and Nineveh repented. Then the second dot on our map is they went ahead and invaded that northern kingdom of Israel in 721. So what happens? Here comes the prophet Nahum in 640. So not too much, not too long after that, about a hundred years after Jonah, Nahum comes on the scene which is where we are with this book, prophesying against Assyria and Nineveh again. And this time telling them that Babylon is going to invade them, which they did, true to God's word, in 612 BC. Okay, and then later, Babylon invades that southern kingdom in Judah and Jerusalem and destroys the temple down there. They actually invaded it three times. And the third time, they destroyed the temple down there in 586 BC. So a lot of people know that that temple uh, was destroyed in 586 BC, and they took the people of of Judah and Jerusalem into exile for 70 years. So let me just read those five points again on this timeline. You start with Jonah way back in 760 BC, and then Assyria invaded the northern kingdom in 721. So here comes Nahum to prophesy against him again in 640 BC, about 100 years after Jonah. And then um, Babylon invaded them in 612, just like Nahum said they would. 
And then later on in 586 BC, Babylon also invades down south in Judah and destroys the temple. So now let's look at a brief outline. And this outline is simply three bullet points, one for each chapter of the book. Only three chapters in this book. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Chapter one actually does not focus on Assyria. It focuses on God, God's sovereignty, God's uh, superiority, his supremacy on his wrath and his justice. Pastor Landon said it's about the God, right? And the, the word there for the Lord is Adonai. And Adonai comes from the word Adon, and the root meaning of that is to rule. So again, the sovereign rule of God. It means Lord or Master, and at times it's a term of respect, like an acknowledgement of Lordship, kind of like you, you call your boss Sir, and you acknowledge that you're under their authority, right? <clears throat> so here, here this displays the sovereign God um, who has every right, every uh, uh, appointment of authority to decree justice, to, to you know, to create um, a rule of law and to enforce it. So you have this angry God, but this is a righteous anger. This is pure justice. And it ties into everything we've said so far about, um, you know, it's God's love, his mercy, um, his His purity of justice um, that, that, that you see in this, in the wrath. And in all these prophets that come, it's God saying, look, this is what you're doing. You know, in, in all these cases, the the wickedness has bubbled to the top the wickedness is in power there's <clears throat> all kinds of deception all kinds of abuse and misuse of people and harm to innocent people and babies and children especially it's just flipped upside down where evil is in control and so god's love is that you know he can't allow that to go on and he's he's angry and jealous and you know avenging and that's what chapter one is about <clears throat> it's the supremacy of god and his treatment of violent nations so it's a message not just to Assyria but to all nations then in chapter 2 uh, it focuses on Nineveh the city the capital city this you know think about it a uh, big city all the commerce all the action right all the wickedness all the spirits <clears throat> according to Bible project this chapter unfolds in stages you know as the fall is happening it shows all the steps of the fall so we'll see that as we read through and it's it's God saving Israel from their enemy and it predicts, according to Bible Project, now according to the PDF, uh, the source in the description, it predicts ba the Babylonian invasion as if it already happened. As if it already happened, which again, we know it did. History bore that out. He was a true prophet, right? It, it happened exactly as he said. All right, and then chapter three is the fall of Assyria as a whole. So here we see them reaping what they've sown. And um, in chapter three, the king has seen fallen and he's alone. And instead of coming to his help, it's celebrated that he's he's fallen. So this makes me think of like in modern day Saddam Hussein when he was captured, Osama bin Laden when he was finally found, and Hitler, right? And you can think of some of the most evil despots when they when they die or are captured, we celebrate, right? <clears throat> um, the the Church of Christ PDF points out that Nahum three eighteen to nineteen shows that the military and political leaders were asleep at the wheel. It calls them slumbering shepherds. And uh, and and I'm sure not just military and political, but religious as well. How familiar does that sound? I know a lot of us in U.S. feel that our leaders are slumbering. Uh, the church, the church is as or more guilty of that, right? The slumbering shepherds in chapter 3. And Pastor Landon points out that this book predicts in 311 that Nineveh will be hidden. And indeed it was until it was discovered in 2400, I'm sorry, 2400 years later in 1840 AD. So Nineveh somehow was, I guess, covered over under a bunch of rubble, whatever, but it was hidden for 2400 years and uh, found in an archeological exploration in 1842 AD. So just like Nahum said, Nineveh was hidden. So some summary and, and uh, additional thoughts here. This is God's proclamation against Assyria and her capital Nineveh through the Nahum uh, Nahum the prophet, who was an Elkishite, and we don't know anything about that, Elkishite. Um, it's God's wrath, yes, but really his goodness, his justice, his mercy, and his great love. What a theme. That is the theme that has come out of every major and minor prophet up till now, as, as I'm reading through. And you can go find those playlists. on. Um, you can find a link to them in the description, but you can find them on my main page of my YouTube channel. <clears throat> Just go through them in order if you want. Um, for a continuous play. They're, they're uh, listed in a variety of playlists, so you can kind of um, listen to them either in the, the full long playlist or in book by book. Okay, so um, 
you're talking about God's wrath, think of the father who finds someone hurting their child. Okay. This isn't some impulsive, angry abuser God. This is a God of, of righteousness, of integrity, of, you know, <clears throat> um, intentionality and commitment. Like I said, think of a father who finds someone hurting their child or the jealousy of a husband who sees a snake trying to win the affections of his wife. That's the type of wrath we're talking about, right? I mean, have you heard, have you heard the difference between jealousy and envy? <clears throat> envy being when you want something that belongs to someone else, right? That's that's not healthy. Jealousy being protective of something that's yours, you know, when somebody else has what's yours. And that's the one that really, really pings our emotions, right? <clears throat> think about the emotions that rise within you when you're wrong that way. Just think about it. I mean, it, it stirs anyone's emotions when someone has what's yours. Either they take a relationship that's yours or, you know, or some item or possession that's yours or your job. So this is a God as a protective father and mother only on steroids, right? Like a mama bear. It even uses metaphors about the protectiveness of lions. So this is God protecting Israel and others against her enemies. Verse one, two says, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is fierce in wrath. So another attribute of his love is that he's giving time and opportunity here. See, if, if there was no such thing as time, there would be no time to repent, right? No time to make things right. So God is delaying. His delay is not weakness. His delay is his long suffering and patience because he really wants to give everyone opportunity to repent. And what he's doing there is he's, he's separating the wheat from the tares because he will act when it is crystal clear um, who is wicked and who is not. Those hard hearts that refuse to turn right time is what tells that so this is an extension of god's charity and mercy psalm 81 says oh that my people would listen to me i would feed them with the finest wheat and with honey from a rock i would satisfy them and that's a little bit of my paraphrase because i left some words out but i'm going to read it again this is one of my old memory verses and listen to how it shows god's longing for his people psalm 81 oh that my people would listen to me i would feed them with the finest wheat and with honey from a rock i would satisfy them and this is for anyone who re repent. This is the story of redemption, isn't it? Um, verse 115, you see here a messianic reference, which remember Jesus in every book. In the last book, um, we saw, um, darn, I can't, I can't think of that one, but in the book of, of Micah, and you can get my, um, my two videos on that. It's a short, uh, just, just by way of a little rabbit trail. That's a very short book too. So you only have the introduction and the book together. You don't have like 10 videos of reading with that one. And this one will probably be the same way, but we see Jesus in every book of the Bible. And in this one, it says uh, one verse one fifteen. look to the mountains, the feet of the one bringing good news and proclaiming peace. So this is referring like people, you know, uh, trumpeting a serious fall, bringing that good news of a serious fall. But some believe it's also an allusion to the coming Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Look to the mountains, the feet of one bringing good news and proclaiming peace. And really, if you read it in some of the other versions, it sounds even more like a messianic reference. So author Pinker says, Nahum does not express sublime thoughts. He does not confront the Lord with questions of justice in the universe or provide insight into truth and life. Now, let me stop there in the middle of his quote and say, I love what he's saying here. And I agree with him, except that I think Nahum does give some insight into truth in life. Just what I was saying, it, it expresses the, the principles of God's justice, um, kind of as a philosophical warning. Um, so in that way, he does kind of give in principles, insight into truth in life. But, but let me go back and re read what he's saying because it's really good. <clears throat> so he says, Nahum does not express sublime thoughts. He does not confront the Lord with questions of justice in the universe or provide insight into truth in life or bemoan societal inequalities or moral decadence. Rather, Nahum comes across as a prophet who is steeped in the tradition of literary prophecy and its genre. His poetry is unique in the Hebrew Bible in its rich and lively imagination. His greatness is his descriptive capabilities, the power of his imagery, which are unrivaled by any other prophet of the Hebrew Bible. In clear rhythmical language, which again won't come through in English really, but in clear rhythmical language, he presents his original descriptions and perceptions, bringing to life entire scenes with a few words. Now it does come through poetically, you know, it's, I really like the similes, metaphors, allusions. Um, 
so so I like that a lot but definitely a lot of the poetry doesn't come through in translation so you have these literary techniques like it, you have the personification of beauty the contrast of good and evil with good ultimately triumphing you have lightning fire storms fury and destruction so it's, it's just a beautiful beautiful um, ancient document I can't wait to read it I hope you'll you'll join me for that and or go get it out and read it for yourself and then read it again later and then listen to mine and go online and you know listen to the Nahum overviews really get this book in your spirit and in your heart listen over and over again um, that's what we're supposed to do right if the Bible says hide the word in our hearts to to let it transform us it's a living and active document it's just beautiful and amazing I can't say enough enough good about it it's my passion to see everyone reading their Bible um, for that reason, I'm giving away uh, free one-year Bibles as long as supplies last. You can find that information in the description of the YouTube. You can find my contact information, donation information. If you want to help me give more Bibles away, that'd be great. Um, it's, you know, I just love, it's my way of giving back. If I can give more, that'd be great too. And also in the description, you're going to find the references for all the sources that I use. Um, again, the playlist for, playlist links for um, other parts of the YouTube channel, including the um, the reading for this book. Uh, let's see, that's if I remember to put that in there. <laughs> and as always, if you click subscribe with the bell, you'll be notified when the next video comes out. So thank you so much for joining. Until next time, God bless you.